Programming Throwdown, Episode 62, PHP and Hack. Take it away, Jason. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back. First uh, podcast of the year. Um, unless you're on the Chinese New Year, then I think this is like nearing the end of your year, right? Um, is that true? I, I think, Isn't it yeah, like start, no, I think it starts like next week. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Well, okay. it depends on when this is released. <laughs> oh, yeah, good point. Touche. Um, so yeah, maybe January twenty eighth, be beginning of the year. Oh, interesting. So yeah, this will, this may be the beginning of the year for for everybody, uh, for all for both calendars of which I'm fully aware. Um, so we have our t-shirt winners, uh, Josh P and Sam R, uh, two Patreon subscribers that I drew at random, and uh, actually this is kind of. I don't know, funny or sad or whatever. I was going to use the, the Patreon API and write a Python script and do all this stuff. And then I realized Patreon just lets me download a CSV with um, with with all the, the names and email addresses of people who have subscribed. So I put that CSV into Excel and then I just random randomized the rows. <laughs> totally. After telling everyone I was going to learn the uh, Patreon API, it turns out I didn't even have to do that. I used trusty dusty Excel. Um but uh, yeah, when, it, when after that random function, Josh P and Sam R were at the top of the list, and uh, um, they both will be getting some pretty epic T-shirts. Uh, I'm probably gonna send them out later on this week. Uh, this week being the week we record, so by the time you uh, listen to this, I would have already sent out the shirts. But congrats to you two, and I hope you really uh, yep. like. And your thank shirts. you to all of our patreon subscribers and to all of our listeners whether or not you support us we thank you yeah definitely and we'll probably do this again uh, i don't know really the cadence or things like that but uh we'll definitely do this again and and do more giveaways like this so uh thank you for subscribing following us uh, uh you know uh, getting uh following our link to audible uh checking out the books we recommend and things like that that's really sort of what keeps so the whole show and all the expenses covered and, and keeps kind of everything together. And if you're interested in a t-shirt, uh, there's a link to it on programmingthrowdown.com on where you can get those. That's right. It's pretty cool. There's a regular t-shirt and there's a ringer t-shirt, which are, those are actually my favorite. The ringer t-shirts are the ones where the, you know, what do you call it? The end of the sleeve like that, Cu- I guess that cuff? ring. Yeah. The sleeve cuff is a uh, like kind of, like a thicker material and a different color. So it kind of like grabs your arm. I don't know. I kind of like those shirts. But yeah, they're both available. And I think there's even a hoodie available if you're interested in that. Well, I want to rant about online television. All right. I feel this is one of those things we can talk about. And then five years from now, then we'll look back and realize how crazy it was when this was a problem, like whether or not to buy a smartphone or other classic examples. And this is, I don't have very good reception in my house. So I try to put up an antenna, it doesn't work. Cable's too expensive. I don't, maybe that's just me being cheap, but I feel like for how much value I get out of it, actually paying for the normal cable subscription, they want to add all this extra stuff and it's too expensive. But I have been happy. I agree, totally. Okay, yeah. And this is increasingly common from what I understand. I think lots of people are cutting cable. Um, but there's a lot of services, Sling TV, the PlayStation View, in, the, in America at least. And um, now there's like a dish, a direct TV one. Um, but one of the issues is there's still all these weird things that happen. Like we wanted to watch, my wife and I wanted to watch the Golden Globes on Sunday night. And we just assumed okay. it would be on the PlayStation View, which is the one we currently use. And we... It, the guide said it was going to come on. I could set it to be recorded. We sat down and then it was, you know, just a kind of a message screen saying the rights to this are blocked by the network. And it was like, no, really? Yeah. So apparently, oh. even though in kind of every other way, our subscription acts kind of like a cable subscription, there was some rights conflict between NBC and the kind of Golden Globes themselves about online streaming permissions. And there's basically no legal way to stream the Golden Globes online. This is a like a huge mess. I mean, I have this problem with the Olympics where it's, it's I feel like it, I, actually, I think we talked about this last Olympics. We talked about how 
this Olympics would be totally on the internet and then that didn't happen. But um, I feel like every Olympics, and, and this is true for the World Cup as well, the rules are different. Like the technology seems to be the same and we could have streamed even eight or 12 years ago, the Olympics, but, but the policy is completely different. Like I think two Olympics ago, you could see everything. And then the last Olympics, they had kind of highlights. And I think this Olympics is the same as the last one where you could get highlights. But if you want to, you know, just watch it as if it was a TV station, um, you had to have cable. And it's just kind of, I don't know. I feel like this is just like a house of cards. You know, basically, you know, they've built up all of these different policies around when you could show and how you can show and the advertisers, you know, what they get and what they don't get and what your commitment to them. And all it takes is really someone just kind of cracking this egg, like someone just getting a deal with the NBA, the NFL and a few other networks and the whole thing will just fall apart. I don't know that that will happen, though. Um, because one of the issues is they negotiate really long contracts. And so I think part oh, really? of the issue is like some of these, it's like for the next five or 10 years. And so oh, those geez. contracts may or may not talk about streaming. Streaming will change dramatically in five years and they don't come up at the same time. And then also I think there's other issues in our consideration. But but the, for, for me, it's just, I'm, pretty happy with my I first I had um, the sling TV that was pretty good I, I actually like the PlayStation view much better this isn't a pitch for them I don't get paid by them I wish you had the Roku at one point right uh, I, I still now I'm using the Amazon fire TV I, I think that one's pretty good but I did have a Roku before yeah mm-hmm. um, and it works really well I really like it but then you run into these weird things like what happened I should have been able to watch it I was at the right time. It wasn't even an issue of recording it or not recording it, but there was just no way for me to watch it. And that was really frustrating. You know, I wonder, like, I mean, so Golden Globe, so this is this is going to sound terrible, but I don't even know what the Golden Globes are. I think it's for the best movies, right? Oh, no, that's the Oscars. No, so it's, what it's the similar. Globes? Yeah, similar. And this isn't a pitch. I actually don't care oh, okay. that much about the Golden Globes. It was more just like we'd seen some stuff about it. We weren't. There was nothing else we were planning on watching. And it's just something was like, oh, well, let's sit down and watch that. And then when you could and it was like, oh, now I'm bummed. Yeah, right. It's a forbidden fruit now, right? Yeah, but I didn't even care that much about it. Like if yeah, I had just yeah. known the, uh, I wouldn't be able to stream it, I wouldn't have cared. I've started, you know, I have a bunch of YouTube uh, subscriptions and that's just become my source of entertainment. Like YouTube and uh, various kind of funny, uh, you know, pages on Facebook and the funny subreddit on Reddit. Um, I just, you know, I've, I mean, to be fair, I didn't grow up with television. I actually never had cable TV, um, uh, until I met my wife and, and we moved in together. So I just, my parents just never really had it. Um, and so for me, it's like, it's not that unnatural to just be completely oblivious, like almost anything TV related, even really movies. Um, I actually only recently saw the star Wars, like the original movies. Um, and, and so for me, it's all just YouTube and internet. And I feel as if that's just going to become more and more popular. And eventually, like, even if the contracts are, are for a long period of time, just the economics will collapse. Hmm. But maybe that's not true. I mean, maybe our people are just really set. I know for like sports, for example, you know, the NFL channel is always going to be popular. Like nothing's going to change that. You know, they're not going to make a new set of teams or anything. An, a YouTube only NFL. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine? I mean, it's. I guess it's totally possible, right? There's nothing. Well, the problem is you need to build the stadiums, right? I, I don't know. And some people say the e gaming or e sports, but I just find those to be complicated in a way that isn't enjoyable in the same. And I'm not a big sports fan, but when I sit down and try to watch like streaming League of Legends on Twitch, it just confuses me. Oh, yeah. I actually like um, there's people who uh, play games on Twitch and they just kind of tell jokes and just like they have raffles for prizes and stuff while they're playing. And I find that to be like pretty good background noise. Okay, yeah, that could Um, be interesting, like a person. But I mean, like watching the tournaments, I guess I don't play football, but I understand watching football and I understand the game, maybe just because I always have. But like sitting down and watching League of Legends yeah, I think we've talked about that before. But yeah, 
It just seems yeah, so fast the, moving and fast paced. It, it it just seems it isn't really conducive to sitting back and just watching. Yeah, I think the problem with these games is you can't like zooming out doesn't really work. Like like football, it works because you're zoomed out. Like if I was on the field, I wouldn't be able to see everything would be just a blur. And they're moving so fast and they're so strong. Like I was blown away. I actually got an opportunity to go to Levi Stadium, which for people who don't know, that's the where the San Francisco 49ers play. Well, where the San Francisco 49ers go... lose. <laughs> where they actually, again, I don't follow, but I, I heard that they're they did really, really like, bad what, the worst year. team in the league. Yeah. But yeah. Um but yeah, actually I got to go on the field, which is really cool. Um but I had no idea like how big it is. And it's one of these things like, okay, you know, it's a hundred yards, it's very obvious. But like unless you really go on the field it doesn't really make sense like you're you know like the idea that like these players they get tackled and sometimes they fall four yards i mean it's like an insane it's 12 feet like you, the person someone fell like two uh heights of a person in in length right and so uh so th- my point is like you know those people are moving really fast and it's totally insane but when you zoom up really far and you're looking from a blimp or from a stadium seat, it just looks like little ants moving really slowly. Um, and so you can watch football and kind of get an idea of what's going on. But for e-gaming, it doesn't really work. Like you're seeing the same screen as the person playing and it's just it's just a total blur, right? Hmm. Maybe they need a special view for spectators, you know, where it's zoomed out, but then you wouldn't be able to really make anything out, you know, or maybe just, there's a reason why football fields are very bland looking, right? Yeah. And and I guess it's been, been around for longer, right? That football, there were lots of kinds of sports that aren't televised. Uh, I assume so. I don't know. Or failed sports that nobody even plays anymore just because they're not conducive, not interesting, whatever. So they, that's kind of a self-fulfilling thing. Football was interesting to people and it made good TV, which meant people were invested in tweaking it to make good TV. So eventually yeah, we'll come across totally. a game that's both fun to play and very suitable for streaming, and then it'll catch on. Yeah. I think, though, there's actually like, I think there's definitely something to making like basically two views of, of a game. So there's the person who's playing gets one view. But then if you're watching, you know, if you're if you're a spectator watching professionals play, you the graphics will just change for you. In other words, like all the details of like the trees, all that stuff kind of becomes very bland so that you could understand what's going on. Hmm. Like almost like cheating, but uh, but the actual people playing don't get that luxury, you know. Well, for the StarCraft competitions, I know they like remove the fog of war so that you know, you can kind of see the ambush oh, yeah, about okay. to happen and stuff. So that's similar to what you're saying. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Cool. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think it's it's a total mess. It's like, it's everything is a surprise. Like you go to watch the Olympics, like surprise, you know, you need a Comcast account, right? And uh, I don't know. I, I think I see your point that it probably won't get fixed either. <laughs> it's kind of sad. But on the flip side, there's a lot of, really awesome entertainment on uh, YouTube and other sources. Um, Okay, so on to news. Um, This is pretty cool. This is one of these, uh, you know, security things I don't really know, don't have a strong background in, but uh, it's actually okay because this link kind of, it's a presentation um, from a team called uh, Team Pangu, and they're the team that has um, jail done the jailbreak on the most recent iPhones. And so they actually walk step by step through, um, how to jailbreak, um, you know, an iOS seven, and they don't actually walk you through how to do it to your own phone, but they walk through like specifically in terms of like the firmware and the software and the buffers and like exactly what is happening when you jailbreak your phone. And they describe sort of the arms race uh, between them and Apple. So they say, you know, oh, look, iOS 7, we did this. And then Apple countered with this. And then iOS 8, we did that. And, uh, you know, it's a PowerPoint presentation. So it's it's meant to, to be delivered to like a lay audience, um, not super technical. Um, 
but it's it's really cool. The other thing I didn't realize: these people who do the jailbreaks are all Chinese, which uh, which is pretty cool. Um, I had no idea um, um, that it was like a team out of China. I think it's awesome, and uh, they they kind of you know did a really good job kind of explaining who they are, uh, what they've done, and uh, it's part of a. They actually run a mobile security conference called Mosec. You can go to mosec.org and check it out. And they actually, that's in Shanghai. So if you're a you know, security expert and you want to check out Shanghai, you could get your boss to, yeah. to, to get you to go to this conference. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought it was super cool and interesting. I always kind of wonder how these hacks actually work. And, uh, and so they explain it in pretty good detail. So is there any... I mean, particular reason why it's a group out of China? Like, what do they explain the motivation? Or it's just they happen to be the people most interested in it? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Like, um, it's obviously a lot of work. You know, I guess if you're a security researcher, maybe it's paid work to do that. But that's one of the things that always interests me is, do, are people just that generous with their free time and that's what they want to work on? Well, these this is definitely a company where they're getting paid somehow. Oh, okay. Um, my guess is, uh, yeah, like who would pay to have a jailbreak for iPhone? I mean, obviously users, but no, no single user would pay enough money to justify it. And they're not really crowds crowdfunding it. Um, yeah, it's a great question, right? Like, like, you know, who, where's like follow the money, right? Uh. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, and, yeah, I mean, if anybody out there knows, any of our listeners know, like just in general, security firms uh, that do like commercial hacking, like hack the PS4, hack the iPhone, hack the Android, like sort of like who really funds those? I assume some of the hack, many of the hacks are done by people trying to get money, right? So I'm trying to hack your account so I can use it as a botnet to make you click on my ads or click on the ads of my competitor, whatever it is that botnets do. Um, so there's that kind of hacking. And so there's security researchers who spend a lot of time researching that so they can kind of show how, like in white papers, how smart they are, that people will pay them to check out their stuff to make sure it's correct. Um, so it's like a proof of work, I guess, because they can't talk oh, about... Oh, that makes sense. Can't talk about, I, I went to Jace, Jason Co., and found 20 flaws and fixed them because Jason Code doesn't want to admit that it had any flaws. And so you have to do it in like this way where you can kind of show your prowess. That makes sense. I mean, the other thing is if I, if I knew a group of people who are all very reputable in the security realm and I was a giant company like a Google or a Microsoft or something, then maybe I would fund it. You know, in other words, like, like uh, they do Microsoft has like gives all their employees i'm sure windows phones and so if there's an exploit in the windows phone then like that means someone can read microsoft employee emails and microsoft's so big they could afford to you know pay one of these teams to try to hack their phone um just to prevent that right there's also bounties some companies do if you find a flaw they'll give you you know decent sized monetary rewards yep Yep. Um, interesting. My next news article or link is to godbolt.org, G-O-D-B-O-L-T.org. And nice. I, I don't, I mean, I guess I don't, that doesn't explain what it is at all. But what it is, is a place for you, it's a compiler explorer um, for C++. It may support other stuff, but that was mo mostly how I came across it. And it's a way of typing in source code in one panel of the website and on the other panel is the assembly output from GCC targeting various processors, um, but I think mostly Intel, uh, maybe only Intel. And it will show you what the assembly instructions generated by the compiler for your source code are. And they have a little example oh, that's cool. that it starts off with. It's not really that interesting, but you can kind of see it pushing onto the stack and, and kind of the rudimentary stuff. But where it really starts getting interesting is where you put in a little more elaborate code or you start adding compiler optimizations, like turning on uh, optimization level three. So that's dash O three um, for GCC. And then watching kind of what it does with the code 
as a result of that. So in the kind of whoa, that's cool. Yeah, I just did it, okay. and uh, it went from like ten instructions to four. Yeah, exactly. So in the kind of naive, non-optimized way, it's doing a lot more, so you can see what's happening. But when you start turning on optimizations in the compiler, the code gets much more compact. You could also do like OS for optimize for size. Um, oh, apparently I type big S. It's a little S. Um, yeah, <laughs> that works. Now I have three. Yeah. And so you can start to play with examples and see what happens, even if you don't understand the assembly, just to kind of see how it interacts is interesting. But then as you start... Will it do the... Uh, will it do the... Uh, um, what's it called? The SIMD? Like if you have a for loop, will it... It will, will do it unrolling. It, it will do some unrolling, but I don't know if it'll do SIMD. I don't... You Maybe it will. Oh, okay. I, I would assume it does if you know what the inch, the flag for it is. Oh, right. Yeah. Cool. This is awesome. Um, it was just really interesting to me. So type in again, playing it with myself by myself was sort of interesting. Um, but then going online and seeing examples other people had of interesting results was really cool too. So in some cases, kind of writing two equivalent expressions will produce vastly different results, like the difference between a one line function and a hundred line function because of how the optimizations in the compiler work. It was able to kind of detect an equivalency for one example, but not for the other. And so it just sort of unexpected corner cases of compiler optimization are interesting. And you see a lot of those online from people who have played around with it. I'm going to try, I'm, I'm going to try, uh, I've always wondered this. I've always wondered if it mattered if you did postfix or prefix incrementer inside of the for loop. And I'm going to prove it to myself one way or the other <laughs> right now. Or at least for GCC version 6.3. So for GCC version 6.3. No optimization. The... Wait, should I do optimization? Do or it not? without. I feel like I should. Do it without orig uh, starting. Okay, I'll do without and I'll do with. Oh, this is such li so good live uh, podcasting. <laughs> but but while, while Jason does that, so he'll come back with his results in a minute. Oh, there he well, goes. It's, I can tell you right now, it's 16, it's 15 instructions if I do A++. If I do plus plus A, it's exactly the same. Uh, so, yeah, so it turns out this is something that I, I think I for, told the audience like a year ago that it doesn't matter. Well, and we for, just a primitive, it. For, a prim <laughs> for a primitive in the for loop where you're not using oh, the true. result. That's right. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't matter if it's as you said, like an int. Like if it's, if it's you know object plus plus, and you've defined the prefix operator to be way more efficient, then then yeah, all bets are off. Uh, but yeah, this is totally cool. I mean, this is already useful. <laughs> so so for people, Jason's going to go prove a bunch of coworkers wrong. Um, so for people <laughs> who are interested about assembly or want to poke around with this, this is actually very informative, even without kind of knowing what all the Intel instructions are you can start to get a feel for it just by playing around with really simple instructions and seeing what's the same and what's different yeah that's awesome um <clears throat> so yeah my news is json logic this is one of these things that's like i have yet to think of a way this could be really useful but it's just so interesting i feel like there's got to be something uh useful in this um the idea is, is, as it suggests, it's it's effectively a programming language in JSON where you write JSON. So, um, you know, P JSON is this is this you know container format. Um, so it's like XML and these other and these other container formats. Um, and so, you know, typically JSON would hold you know a, a document with a bunch of fields like. Uh, you know, name, colon, JSON, age, colon, blah, 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 right? Um, and, uh, you know, JSON can hold, you know, objects, can hold arrays, it can have arrays of objects of arrays, et cetera, et cetera. And it can, can it has a not really nice representation for storing data. Um, the question always becomes, you know, let's say you're trying to describe um, a topology of a neural network, or you're trying to describe some kind of process like which function should I be using? Um, you could have JSON and you could have a bunch of C++ code that looks at your JSON and then you know invokes the right object or looks at your JSON and then adds those two ar arguments together. This JSON logic actually lets you kind of uh, write 
code kind of in JSON. You can add numbers in JSON. You can kind of have arbitrary equations in JSON. And then, uh, uh, and then you can compile it with this or interpret it, I suppose, or interpreter. And so a good example of this would be if you have sort of a bunch of parameters, like uh, one parameter kind of makes your website kind of slower in this way, but faster for images. And you have another parameter that kind of tweaks your website in some other way. And you want to sort of play with these parameters based on sort of what's happening. Like, oh, if a lot of people are getting images, I want to like boost my image stuff. So it's almost like you want this sort of equation, but you want to be able to hot swap it. You want to be able to say, oh, I need my, you know, I want the, this parameter plus that parameter is equal to that parameter. And like, I want to make that change right away. Um, this will let you do that. And so it looks kind of cool. As soon as I find a project that can use it, I will give it a shot <laughs> and let you know how it goes. My next link is to a collection of interesting bitwise operators and tricks. Uh, also an opportunity to talk about bitwise operators. But on this website, there are just, I don't, I didn't, they're not numbered and I didn't count them, but dozens of uh, bitwise operations and what they do. And it's nothing complicated, just like how to calculate two to the N. Well, that one's a little obvious, I guess, you know, using oh, left cool. shift. Whether checking whether a number is a power of two, um, then there's some more interesting stuff like averaging two numbers using bitwise operators, uh, trying to find some other good ones. Set the rightmost zero bit to one. Turns out it's actually fast pretty easy, inverse but... square root. Wow. Yeah, I th is that the one? One of those is famous. We were before the show talking about John Carmack. One of those is famous because John Carmack used it in Quake. Is it inverse square root? I think I think he did the square root. Oh, uh, that might be. But uh, um, I'll look it up. No, it's fast inverse square root. Yep, it's Carmack. Um, and so the, oh, the that's what it's Carmack just a did. list. Yeah. So there's just a list of kind of interesting operators. I don't know that there's a particular great reason to use these normally. I mean, they're really interesting. Your code is probably better off r writing it all the way out than kind of using these condensed forms. But if you write really fast yeah, this code. Is, this has the advantage where it's very hard to get fired if you used a lot of these oh. because you've made yourself absolutely critical. To, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't really see any reason for using these. Again, I think the compiler would do the optimization for you. Uh, so there, if you're really trying to get code size down or really trying to get some something accomplished fast. These are really cool. They're also really awesome for just thinking about this. And what I do wanted to call this out as part of it is um, I've talked to various people who are kind of, you know, what, what, what are things to be ready for in preparing for an interview? And one of the things is bitwise operations come up a lot. And depending on where you are in the stack, you maybe get away without it. But for most people, you know, kind of understanding how computers work is sort of a given. And part of how mm -hmm. computers work is how bitwise operators work. And so being prepared to kind of talk about binary forms of numbers and manipulating those is something that's pretty important. So if you don't know that and you're kind of doing anything except for super, super high level work, that's something worth thinking about. And a, a page like this, although you may not remember them and you probably shouldn't use them, uh, will get you thinking about those and kind of being a puzzle, see if you can figure out or at least, you know, looking at it, understand why it works, um, even if you couldn't yeah, come up with really it on your own. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I think that's also a, super a lot of thing. these have references. Like it's not just here's a line of code. It actually have a link to a document explaining exactly what it's doing. Yep. And so um, this is something I'd recommend for any of you who are kind of trying to interview or just interested in low-level code. Um, to kind of brush up on bitwise operators. There's there's lots of links like this. This is just one I happened to run across that I thought was had some kind of nifty operators in there. Yeah, this is really cool. I actually sat on an interview years ago where the, the candidate was interviewing for a firmware engineer job. And uh, there was all sorts of questions like this. Like there was a bunch of numbers that were packed into three bits each, uh, you know, so it's, is uh, each number was packed into three bits and uh, you have to sort of unpack them and things like that. Time for book of the show. 
book of the show. <clears throat> My book of the show is Richard Dawkins uh, is the author. The book is The Selfish Gene. Um, this is, I mean, I don't know if you'd call this controversial or not, but but this is absolutely. So Richard Dawkins is an evolutionary biologist. And so, you know, the whole book is, is explaining a facet of evolution. Um, but uh, uh, But the idea is, um, you know, there's evolution, there's survival of the fittest, and there's you know, a lot of these terms that Charles Darwin uh, and others have, have sort of uh, coined that have become part of, you know, common, uh, uh, like, part of, like, common core, like what most people understand. Um, but then there's this idea, like, there's sort of this a number of things that sort of are, you know, a little counterintuitive. Like, for example... Um, you know, cancer can kill almost anyone. There's some viruses that are incredibly powerful. And so why is humanity getting more and more complicated? Or why is just nature getting more and more complicated? Uh, you know, even though simple things seem to be very efficient and very powerful, you know, it doesn't seem to fit with the survival of the fittest, right? And so that, that, that uh, concept is called the arrow of complexity. The idea that just complexity in the universe keeps increasing. We don't really know why. Um, there's another idea, which is if you believe in survival of the fittest kind of on an individual level, then a lot of these systems, like ecological systems, become unstable if you were to model them in this way. In other words, if all the lions are trying to kill and eat as many zebra as possible, then um, what happens is all the lions eat all the zebra and then everyone starves, you know. And, and so, uh, um, you know, people had kind of wondered, oh, maybe th there's enough zebras that are faster than the lions that they live to an old age and stuff like that. But even then, it's like a very unstable equilibrium and it didn't seem very likely. Um, Richard Dawkins tackles a lot of these issues in the selfish gene, which is, I think, super interesting. Um uh, you know, I mean, just not to do too much of a spoiler, but basically the idea is that the genetic code is the thing being selfish, not the individual. And so, in other words, you know, a lion will not kill 10 zebras if it can only eat one. It will kill the one zebra and it will eat it. And it'll take us so much time to eat it that the other nine zebra get away, even if they're all slower. Um, and so the idea is like, Richard Dawkins makes this this conjecture that that you know the genetic code is selfish. So what that means is even if the lion can kill ten zebras, it just won't, um, because the zebras and the lions are sharing much of the same genetic code, and that code is trying to be as diverse as possible. So if for whatever reason lions can't survive anymore, the genes themselves get to live on in the zebras or the fish, right? Or whatever. So um, the book covers a ton of things. I mean, this is just one of them. And he's also written several other books. Um, but I just think these things are fascinating. Um, I was very fortunate to have been able to ask Richard Dawkins a question. Um, uh, he was a keynote speaker at a conference and he also took questions. And uh, um, uh, our team kind of sub uh, submitted a question, which he answered. You know, we were kind of asking about this era of complexity and, uh, um, you know, we asked like how this was actually before, I think he actually ended up writing about it later, but this was, you know, back like 2004, um, he actually explained kind of what he thought, um, about that era of complexity. And he thought that it was, um, trying to get new food that basically, you know, effectively like trees are trying to find new ways to keep the food away from us or make it harder to reach and animals are trying to find new ways to get that food. And that sort of arms race is sort of what's making things more and more complex. Um, but yeah, I think it's a super interesting read. Highly recommend it. My book of the show is Abaddon's gate by James S a Corey, which is a pen name for actually two authors, but this is the third book in the expanse series and um, I can't say much about it since it's the third book. Uh, obviously, <laughs> I read books one and two, and so now I'm to the third. And I'm, you know, well, I, so I, 
I guess the test for a series like that is whether you're going to read the next book. And so I think I'll probably read book four. So I, I guess that's a recommendation for book three. Um, and Why would they do a pen name? Do you know? So I think, I mean, I think just because just it's a little general. easier to sell rather than having two authors' names on, you know, so people... Oh. I, I don't... That's a good question. They probably have answered it. Um, there's several interviews with the, the two authors. I'm sorry, I'm not saying their names right now. I don't remember what they were. Um, but they kind of write oh. as this person. They can kind of give this person their own character, I guess, and, and then write that way. And the series is pretty good. And one of the things is I, I didn't actually... Uh, kind of realized that the TV version on the Sci-Fi Channel, Sci-Fi Channel. I don't know how you say that. That oh the yeah, they changed it yeah. Sci-Fi or something, right? Yeah, and so on that channel, I watched the first couple episodes of the Expanse TV series, and although it's not kind of accurate to page by page in the book, they have very much the same feel and very much the same themes. And I found it, although it's a little, it's pretty dark. It's overall, the series itself is kind of dark. Um, and so the, the TV show was pretty dark, but I found myself enjoying it. And I saw a brief interview with the two authors who consult heavily. Yeah, the authors, I can tell you the names are Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank. Okay. Frannick. Thank you. The internet. It's so useful. Um, <laughs> And so they were interviewing them about the Expanse TV show. And one of the things they were saying is that they don't, they're writers of the book and they consult and kind of give ideas. But ultimately, there are people who understand writing for TV, choosing what themes to pull forward and what parts of the story to modify to make it make sense for TV. So they're not, what they call those like screenwriters, I guess. Those people. Right. Yep. And they consult with the, the two authors, but they're trying to have a relationship so that it doesn't have to be true to the book at the expense of bad TV, but not great TV and leave just, it's just inspired by the book. So it's, it strikes a good middle ground. Yep. It's similar to the walking dead. Um, you know, like, uh, the walking dead, you know, at first I, I, you know, I read all the comics. Um, and then when the show came out, um, I was like, Hey, Lynn's uh, to my wife. I was like, Hey, you should check out this show. And I kind of was pretty sure she wasn't going to like it because, the book is sort of very kind of tactical and it talks a lot about, you know, surviving and the zombie apocalypse and, and it's also kind of gruesome and there's just not a lot of like touchy feely or like emotion type stuff in, in the comic. Um, and, and, uh, when we watched it, we, we both realized that like they actually kind of made it into more of a drama to fit sort of the TV medium. And, and as a result, we both now really like it. Yeah, so The Expanse is good. If you aren't really a book reader, but you do watch TV, I'd recommend checking out the TV series. Uh, and, and if you've read the book and you haven't checked out the TV series, do that as well, because you'll kind of know what's... You don't know what's about to happen, but you kind of know what's going to happen, if that makes sense. So eventually the things you know are yep. going to happen are going to happen, but they may happen sort of differently than you expect. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, totally. So it's still worth watching is what I'm saying. Cool. And what is that's on? Oh, it's on Siffy. So I guess you'd get that through like Hulu, Netflix, or that other thing that we don't pay attention to. <laughs> there, well, they're streaming TV as well if you have TV that streams Siffy. Yeah, there's lots of ways to get it. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, gotcha. Depending on your... Well, yeah, anyways. Um, and I actually listen to that on Audible because I have a long commute and that's how I do most of my reading. I just call it reading. Maybe that's unethical, uh, immoral. I think it's reading. No, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, because I, I, listening is too generic, right? Yeah, it sounds confusing. I was talking to someone today and I was like, oh, I read a lot of sci-fi. And then they were kind of like looked at me and I'm like, okay, well, I don't read it. I listen to it. And they were like, what? And I was like, in the car because, you know, I commute. And then I just listen to it. And, and they were saying how they couldn't do it. Um, but for me, it's it's really good because it allows me to kind of do something I enjoy, which is reading these books. But I don't have time to a lot of time to sit down and actually, you know, do page turning. Yeah, exactly. Do you like have you ever, um, you know, started like, I mean, have you ever got so lost in that world that you just show up at work? And you're just like, what happened? Yes. <laughs> like, I feel like that's that would happen to me almost every day. It does happen to me sometimes, and it's really scary. And I don't know whether I actually <laughs> yeah. was paying attention on the road. 
and then my brain just oh, didn't bother like to record it. A slew it. of like just carnage behind you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so this is also um, Audible is a sponsor of the show, and so if you've never tried Audible, not anymore. Before, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, <laughs> if you're interested, um, they have a thing where they'll give you the first book free as like a, a part of a trial, and then after you get that book, you, you're welcome to cancel the subscription. And what they do is typical. The typical thing is you get one book a month, one credit a month, which is good. I've never found a book that wasn't was more than a credit, but I guess it could happen. Um, and so right. you can go to audibletrial.com/slash/programmingthrowdown. I really like Audible. I still pay for my own subscription and, um, you know, I really enjoy the books I get on there and kind of making my commute that much easier. Well, it's still pretty crappy, but at least it's a little less crappy. (laughs) Yeah, actually, maybe next month's news, someone did this awesome visualization of traffic in the Bay Area. And uh, I'll make that news next next month if I remember. So I'm going to create a new slogan for Audible, making Patrick's commute a little less crappy. (laughs) <laughs> there you go <laughs> i'll send that to them. um we're also on patreon patreon so um you should go to patreon.com slash programming throwdown um and uh that's how those those uh um that's how josh p and sam r got their free t-shirts they were lucky uh patreon subscribers um, but that that really kind of helps us out it goes straight to the show uh you know we have an account for it it's not like going into our pockets or anything like that all of it gets redistributed back to help the show in some form or another. So um, thanks for that. And uh, it's time for Tool, Tool of, of the, the show. show. So my mission, every year I set a mission. I don't really call it a resolution because like, I feel like resolution implies that there's a problem that you want to resolve. This is more just like a goal. And if I meet it, it's great. If not, my life doesn't really change that much. It's always kind of something small. Like one year, uh, it was look people in the eyes when I talk to them. Another year, it was uh, um, just, just I think it was like something about being more polite. There was another. I don't know. It's it's it's. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Sometimes they're kind of technical. Uh, this year, it's about organization. Um, so I found uh, when I was kind of reflecting back on the past few months that uh, when I was kind of more organized at work. Um, just, I got a lot more done. The people around me got a lot more done and I could actually just see this almost perfect correlation as I was kind of walking through the past few months, uh, this perfect correlation between when I was organized and our sort of velocity and my velocity. Now, part of that is there's like a chicken and an egg there. Like part of it was I was disorganized because it was a disorganized time in the project. And so, you know, I don't think that it's solely because of that, right? But <clears throat> but it's still something I want to work on. And it's not only getting more organized, but it's also being more efficient with the organizing. Like I want to be able to, you know, take notes, write to-dos, set deadlines for myself, uh, get notified when it's close to those deadlines, check the box when I'm done with them. And I want to do all of this really quickly so I don't have to waste a lot of time. Um, and so my tool of the show is this thing called Emacs org mode, um, org for organization. Um, so for people who aren't Emacs users, uh, Emacs has major modes. So the idea is if you're editing a C++ file, you're in C++ mode. If you're editing an HTML file, you're in web mode. And the mode, you know, it, there's like a massive amount of logic behind each mode, right? So the syntax highlighting is totally different, things like that. Um, org mode is just a completely different environment inside Emacs where you have like a calendar, um, you have like to-do lists and you have all these different ways to stay organized. Um, It's incredibly complicated. Um, I actually, I downloaded it and all that, that was very straightforward. And I was like, oh, let me check out the manual. I was expecting, you know, maybe an eight page manual. There's like a 300 page manual on org mode, Um, (laughs) which makes me think like maybe the only people left using Emacs are people who like, like don't do that much coding anymore. I don't know. <laughs> like the median age of Emacs users maybe now is like 40 or something. But, uh, um, but you know, it looks awesome. I'm just getting into it. Um, and uh, that's my tool of the show. So far, I've, I can say that, you know, you can very quickly get up to speed and do some simple things with org mode. Very nice. 
My tool is cpplint.py, which I is a C++ linter by, I, I think this one's actually made by Google. So it's for the Google style guide. But I also simultaneously would recommend uh, there's an LLVM, or I guess a Clang linter uh, as well, that will do more than just the Google style guide. It actually can do other style guide. Anyway, so linters are my tool of the show. And the reason why is because I find nice. that if you have a style guide for whatever code you're writing in whatever language that it's super useful. And I'm not a big proponent of nitpicking to death people, but keeping everything consistent. And the easiest way I know to do that is to have a linter that just every time someone makes a change, just kind of already will tell them when they're not matching the expected style. And I'm not much one. I'm not one for getting into debating whether you use Google has a C++ style guide. I think there's a Linux C style guide. Um, there's a, which isn't C++, but then there's other versions and other people have style. And someone, you know, kind of the other day was arguing for some new code to use this other kind of style that they preferred. And one of the things I asked them was, you know, is there a linter, or or have you kind of a lint rules for some linter? For, for that, your kind of your way, you're saying that it should be done. And they were kind of like, well, no. And I was like, to me, that's a huge negative where I don't want to adopt your way, not because I particularly think it's bad, but if you don't have a linter for it, to me, that's really frustrating because it doesn't keep everyone honest and it doesn't allow, yep. it allows people to kind of get away when they don't really want to do it or they don't particularly, you know, they don't agree with it. It's just messy. And so I think just having everybody agree and then having a linter is a kind of way to not have conflict. Yeah, and just to explain, I mean, we've covered this in other shows, but but a linter is just something where it will look at your source code and tell you when you violated the style guide. Like it'll actually scan your whole source code and say, hey, at line 46, um, you know, you have an extra space. Uh, you know, on line 48, you know, you just new line doesn't need to be there. And then there's also a formatter, like there's like Clang has a linter and also Clang format. Oh, I guess like we'll the Clang lint, everything. The Clang linter is part of Clang format. Right. Yeah. And so it will just it, it can also just fix almost all the lint errors for you. Um cool. And I, and yeah, I'm not awesome. I'm also yeah, I, I'm, oops, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I'm the same way like I don't enforce the rules um in in code reviews and things like that, but I do think that you need a system that annoys people who have lint errors so in other words like like there's a system every place i've worked has had a system in place where you know if you put if you don't put a space somewhere it gives you a little warning when you try and submit your code and then as long as that system exists i i leave the rest up to the you know leave it to the honor system like let people fix their own issues but if that system doesn't exist then it's just like the wild west like you have to enforce it you know personally like socially and nobody wants to do that yeah, so this is ex sort of similar to what I was going to say, which is I the, I don't make the linter a hard fail. I, some people do. But in my opinion, there's certain times when you should be allowed to kind of break it if you think there's a really good reason for it. And I'm not going to care. But as you said, I've been on teams before that had nothing. And then somebody just gets forgets or whatever in a code review. And then you start having a bunch of code that doesn't comply and then it's a huge hassle to change it. And I think just having an agreed upon style guide keeps the code easy to read. Yep, totally. So linters are my t tool of the show. That's awesome. Yeah, so all right, PHP and hack. Um, so first, shout out to Cyrus. Uh, we won't spoil your last name, but uh, um, Cyrus emailed us and said, hey guys, um, you haven't done PHP. Uh, why don't you talk about PHP and WordPress? And so because you emailed us, this is exactly what we're going to do. Um, PHP is a huge language uh, in terms of, of user base. Tons of people use it. Um, it's amazing we haven't covered it. I actually had to do a double check to make sure we haven't covered it in the past. Um, and, you know, to kind of motivate PHP, um, you know, everyone's kind of done templating, right? Like for example, if you do printf, you do printf, my name is percent s, 
and then comma and then your name, right? You could even do all sorts of crazy logic after the comma. It could be whatever C code you want, but then at the end it's some string that, and then that percent %s, you know, the the what you put in after that comma gets substituted into the percent %s. And you could be really complicated. You could have percent %2d and it puts a number there with two decimal places and everything, right? Uh, if you use Python, they have the, the format function, does the same thing. It even has the same syntax. Um, you know, almost every language has some type of substitution, some way of doing substitution like that. And that's called uh, templating. Um, so <clears throat> PHP, at least when it started, is effectively a way to do templating with HTML. Um, so you could write a bunch of HTML and then... Um, a little different than printf. In the case of printf, you do all these percent %s's and then, and then all of your arguments come afterwards. In the case of PHP, you write all this HTML and then in the HTML itself, you do like a you know PHP bracket and you have some PHP code. Um, but if, at the end of the day, it's still kind of templating like printf kind of stuff, right? Now, why is this important? So put yourself back to the 1990s, right? Like, um, browsers were just crazy. You know, like the iPhone wasn't out yet. Smartphones weren't really out yet, really at all. And uh, and the web browsers, there's just not really any compatibility. Like, you would be lucky if they all rendered the HTML even remotely the same way. Um, JavaScript, forget it. Like, if you had a bunch of complicated JavaScript or even simple JavaScript, you know, there's no way you could guarantee that even 90% of browsers would render it correctly. And so what that means is you have to do everything on the server side. So if someone, you know, clicks a checkbox, you have to actually go to the server, you know, re-render the entire HTML, like what the whole universe looks like now that that checkbox has been checked and send that over to the client. The client's going to refresh the whole browser. And I mean, if you've ever seen old websites, like maybe like your hospital like doctor website <laughs> still works this way or something, but like that that's just that's how the whole internet worked, um, and everything was done on the server, and so uh, you know that made these server templating libraries like PHP really popular. PHP like a lot of people do like to rag on it. I think because it's like any beginner programming language, a lot of people kind of did it as one of their first programming languages. And when you do that, I think it opens it up to a lot of criticism or hate as a inferior language uh, and also mm -hmm. just quirkiness. But, you know, it does have a lot of libraries. PHP has been around for a while. It's There's a lot of support for it. There's a lot of different tools to get done what you need to get done and do the things you're trying to do in it. Uh, and there's also a ton of tutorials because it's such a popular beginner's language. I, or has been a popular beginner's language, then you get a lot of people writing about it and answering a lot of common problems that beginners tend to have and a lot of code examples, a lot of legacy code that you can look at to kind of understand how to do stuff. Yep. One thing PHP does really well, uh, I mean, not the language itself, but the, the maintainers do really well, is uh, the documentation, like if you were to like type PHP printf, and you actually go to the PHP site and look at the printf documentation, um, they have, it's almost like a wiki type style. Like there's the official documentation and then there's all this user contributed content. And uh, that they, they keep that from version to version. So, um, so it's pretty cool. Like if you look up even just printf, uh, uh, PHP printf, you'll see all these things like people say, oh, here's some hack for this. Here's some way to do that. If you want to print an object, here's some code. And it's just it's just become it's almost like a living manual uh, of PHP, which I thought was kind of kind of clever and, and also helps with with the beginner aspect. Um, just to kind of breeze through some of the details of PHP, it's a weekly type language. So you just say, you know, I equals three. And then later on, if you want to say I equals Jim, you can do that. It's fine. Um, it's all of the arrays. So PHP only has, uh, object, um, uh, which is kind of like a class and, uh, well, it's, it gets basically PHP only has arrays. 
but they're associative arrays. And so even objects and classes are kind of represented using these associative arrays. But, you know, it kind of begs the question, like, what if I just want an array of 10 numbers and I want to index into it? So you can actually do that. You can create what we would traditionally call in C or C++ an array. Um, and what PHP does is under the hood, it's still an associative array, but PHP will let you, you know, iterate over it and, and when you go for when you ask for item one, it still works. But to under the hood, it kind of everything is effectively a map in PHP. Uh, it's either a primitive number, like a double or a string, a primitive variable, like a double or a string, or it's a map. Um, in PHP 3, they added classes, um, which is kind of syntactic sugar, um, but uh, obviously very useful. So you have classes with properties and all of that. Um, the biggest advance uh, came from Facebook. So Facebook wrote a language called Hack. Um, Hack is completely uh, backwards compatible with PHP. So in other words, you can have uh, you could have take like uh, WordPress, which is a very popular PHP uh, uh, you know uh, library or tool. Um, you can actually take that and run it in Hack. So anything that's built in PHP will work with Hack, but you can also add, there's some more keywords and some more things you can do in Hack that you can't do in PHP, um, which is which is pretty cool too. One of the other things is it can be compiled. So instead of being interpreted as traditionally, you can compile it and then run it on the HHVM virtual machine. And that allows the code to be faster because as we were talking about earlier in the uh, one of the news slash sites was the god bolt and compiler optimizations and and how it does that and so by doing even just a little bit of compilation you get the ability to kind of optimize things shift stuff around and that's awesome because it allows the programmer to still write something that's very readable without sacrificing speed yep yeah totally so just to kind of dive into some of the things Hack adds, one is it adds types, um, which is very similar to TypeScript. So, you know, you can take just a regular JavaScript file and rename it .ts instead of .js, and it, it's now TypeScript, and it works fine. Um, but once you've done that and you're using the TypeScript compiler, now you can actually go and add, like, int a equals 3 instead of just a equals 3, right? Or, like, this function takes an int x and a float y right um, so hack is the same way and you can slowly over time add types to your code base and uh and and hack will understand if it doesn't see a type that 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 type could be anything but if it does see a type it can you know call out a compiler error um hack adds generics which are super useful right i mean if you want a uh um you know if you want like a set data structure, but you want it to be a set of anything, you can do that with hack. And it works similar to C++. You do set, you know, uh, angle bracket, you know, string, angle bracket, and now you have a set of strings. Um, it's got collections, so you don't even have to write the set. It's already done for you. So it has set, as hash set, hash, hash map. Um, you know, a lot of these common collections that you'd see in Java and other languages. Um, it has Lambda functions which now we have in Java 8. Um, those are just, if you remember, they're just functions as first class citizens. So I could say f equals some function and then pass f to another function or another object. And that object can hold on to f and call it whenever it wants. Um, it also has async support, which is super important, right? Like if you, um, you can actually call a function uh, and then uh, pass it a callback and it'll execute that callback kind of whenever it returns. So just kind of this asynchronous um, kind of mode of programming, which we talked a lot about in the Node.js episode. So if you're asking yourself, I'm starting a new project, should I use PHP? Um, I don't think it's the language du jour, or I don't that sounds too fancy pants. Um, it's not the <laughs> kind of language of the moment. It's not the hot language. But I mean, my understanding, it's still pretty commonly used even for kind of new stuff because there's a lot of people who have been doing it for a long time. And so they're really good at it. They know how to do it. It, it gets the job done. And often that's very important. 
Um, but there's also a lot of legacy stuff written in PHP. And so if you yep. kind of join a project or team that has that, you could very well find yourself maintaining PHP code. Um, but I wouldn't say it's probably the number one choice most people have for uh, the problems on the web. I think there's a lot of other kind of new JavaScript solutions to that or Node.js on the server to kind of accomplish some of the same ideas. And so I, I wouldn't say it's commonly chosen today, but there are probably some areas where it is. And for people who have been doing it, I mean, it, it obviously will be a kind of something at hand for them to choose. And then, you know, that legacy code just doesn't go away. There's a lot of time invested in that. And so I, I would say there's still probably a lot of, a lot of people's days are spent uh, still writing in PHP. Yep. So just to like put it in perspective, so they actually just released this, the uh, T-I-O-B-E. I don't know if I'm supposed to spell that out or not, T-O-B, but the, the T-O-B index, sort of, they use GitHub and a bunch of other metrics to try to predict uh, or to demonstrate sort of which um, language is the most popular. And uh, PHP dropped from 6th to 10th. Uh, between January 2016 and January 2017. Um, and I think a lot of that is just because, you know, a combination of Python, Node.js, and, and some of these other languages are just kind of, you know, picking up more steam. But I mean, I mean, the fact that it's 10th is still very powerful. I mean, there's, there's as, as Patrick said, there's just tons of people using it. But also, I think measures like that, I don't, I'm not familiar with that exact one and the, the methodology, but I think measures like that where you're kind of looking on GitHub and stuff, that's probably a lot of new public development. But, you know, yeah, that's a lot of lines of code get written in legacy systems, not just maintenance, but new features being added. And so, you know, I think those metrics probably skew to new starts. Like there's a, a waiting to the languages that new projects are started in. Yep. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, yeah, I mean, PHP is just insanely popular. Um, so where is PHP used? Um, wow, so many apps, are, are especially open source apps, are built in PHP. Um, you know, WordPress is probably the most common. Um, PHP BB, which is a, a forum. The reason why it's BB, it's uh, from the phrase bulletin board, right? Um did you ever go on bulletin boards? No. Oh yeah, me neither. I, I have friends who have like like really awesome stories about things they did on bulletin boards, like RPGs that they played using message passing. But I think I should invent a past history where I did, but <laughs> just so you could regale us. Yeah. With your bulletin board stories. When I was a kid, back in my day, we passed punch cards back and forth. Um, PHP my admin. Like if you have a MySQL instance, this is the web uh, interface to that. That's extremely popular. Um, I've used all of these: uh, Gallery, Drupal, uh, you know, MediaWiki. Like Wikipedia itself is is all written in PHP and, and is open source. Um, Joomla, which is a super popular content management system. Um, so just a ton of really powerful apps have been written in PHP. And uh, they're, they're so extensible. People have written so many. It's almost like Emacs or VI, right? People have written so many extensions to to uh, to these apps that uh, it's just very hard to office to to um, to make them obsolete. And uh, they'll I'm sure they'll be around for the next ten years. So um, uh, yeah, so that's that's PHP in a nutshell. I mean, as as Patrick said, I also wouldn't really recommend using it for a new product uh, project. Um, I think, you know, Node.js, Python, these other ones are kind of, even like Ruby to a lesser extent are, are kind of making PHP obsolete. Um, but uh, it's still an important language to learn. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking for a job, there's a good chance, you know, there'll be some PHP involved. And uh, um, yeah, and uh, let us know what you think. If you've built anything amazing in PHP that you have on GitHub or somewhere else, uh, let us know and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it on the next show. So to wrap it up, we'll repeat the kind of tools and books you mentioned in the middle of the show so that this is easily, you can scrub to this part easily. Uh, and that was yeah. the, the Selfish Gene, 
Abaddon's Gate. Those were the two books. And then Jason recommended Emacs org mode as a tool of the show. And I recommended Linters. I don't know that that's really actually helpful to say I recommended Linters. Okay. No, I think, I think you know, the people books, the books should are use good. Linters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I think Linters is actually a great tool because it's one of these things that it takes a little bit of work and a lot of people don't want to put in, myself included, don't really want to put in the time to, uh, to integrate it into your workflow. But then we're always so glad we did. And so hopefully we can pass that yeah. nugget of knowledge. Linters are definitely useful. I meant repeating linters at the end for people to look up. Uh, it's oh, <laughs> all right. Sorry. Never mind. That's awesome. But thanks, everyone, a- for, for all our listeners and sticking with us. Jason and I were just uh, regaling each other with stories of yore from the podcast of old. Wow, that sounded yes. awesome. And uh, right. we've been doing this a while, but we enjoy <laughs> it. And we always enjoy hearing from everyone out there in listener land. Yeah, one thing, if, if someone bought a T-shirt, you know, so I bought a T-shirt, uh, uh, you know, just to make sure that uh, it wasn't going to be, you know, that it was going to be good quality and all of that. Um, uh, and I, I feel like it's it's good. I mean, I like it. Uh, but I wear it to work sometimes, which is super cheesy. What? Um, no. I know. <laughs> I know. Self, but, uh, self-promotion. I, actually, <laughs> I know it's kind of cheesy. But uh uh, but no, if, if, if you bought a shirt, I know a few people have bought a shirt. Uh, actually, many people have bought a shirt. Um, and uh, if you have, let me know. Send us an email. Uh, if you think the logo is too big, too small, if you think the T-shirt's amazing, uh, let us know what you think. Um, you know, the T-shirt is still a rather new part of the show. And so uh, we're looking for your feedback. Yeah, I mean, I guess we don't need to know. We already know if you buy it because we know but um, oh yeah don't just tell us you bought it <laughs> yeah. but send us like a picture or, or at hashtag us or tweet us or whatever the cool kids do these days about um you know a picture of you wearing it somewhere cool that would be awesome oh that's a great idea yeah if you uh have yourself wearing the shirt anywhere uh but if it's on like the grand canyon or something that'd be even more epic wait but why the grand canyon because that's like nothing to do with our show i feel like wearing it to a computer history museum or Wearing it in front oh, of yeah, your awesome, you know, VI themed editor or, you know, whatever, something. Yeah. Yeah, you're totally right. Yeah, it needs to be like something you nerdy. like would next to a wax statue of Richard Stallman or something. Um, if you have that picture or any others wearing your wearing your T-shirt, um, post it and, uh, uh, you know, do at programming throwdown or in the case of Twitter, you know, at neural nets for life. And uh, uh, we will we will retweet you and reshare you and 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 embarrass you, and uh, if you want us to, if not, no, just, we won't uh, embarrass you. If, if you embarrass yourself, <laughs> we'll just do the honor of uh, promoting that. That's true. Yeah, we'll we'll amplify your embarrassment. So, um, yeah, but that'd be really cool. Actually, it's a great idea. Either way, let us know what you think of the shirts. All right. Till next time. See you later. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.